everyone, thank you very much for coming along. Today we want to look at some very important issues because of the strange weather we've been having and the world has been having. It's not just us in the Northeast where we're getting very cold and rainy uh, May at this point, but it's really much more the anomalies of weather around the world that are beginning to register themselves, usually in terms of extreme weather. <clears throat> droughts for a long period of time or for deep severity and over a large area or floods. Basically because of the climate change that's occurring on a global scale, the distribution of water is changing. It's changing in some predictable ways but not entirely predictable because it's a chaotic system What's happening is that since there's more heat in the atmosphere, there's more water evaporated and held in <clears throat> the clouds, and those circulate in a very much more dramatic way, spill large amounts of water in some areas and deprive other areas of water. So we're getting dry areas becoming drier, wet areas becoming wetter, and the inconvenience of that is not just the raincoat question and what we're up against, in a sense, in the daily weather pattern, but the multi-year phenomena and the extreme phenomena that will change everything about local circumstances, particularly agriculture and what I want to look at today is soils. Because we're caught in a situation where climate change is changing the nature and the quantities and the vitality of soils. That's crucial because very quickly that will determine the food supply. And that, in fact, is where we usually see it manifest as a crisis first, in the food supply, either because of famine or drought and lack of delivery of food, then we see it as a growing crisis. So we're going to look at climate change, soils, and humans as a keystone species in restoring the global ecosystem. A keystone species is one that's crucial for the functioning of the other species, and we're arguing here that we are a keystone species. Depending upon how we behave, we can make the problem a heck of a lot worse, or start to make it better, both in terms of the global ecosystem and in terms of the larger climate on the Earth's surface. Let's take a look. It's really quite staggering when you look at it. Here's some of the recent reports we're coming up with from Canada and China. This is a compilation in the month of May here, but it'll give you a sense of the crisis. Canada has seen in decades torrential rains inundating streets, homes, and forcing mandatory evacuations. States of emergency have been declared in various parts of Canada, giving firefighters extra resources to battle the flooding. Floodwaters continue to threaten several communities across this country. The military has been called in to help Montreal brace for the worst. Just trying to secure his uh, family home and property, which uh, was his grandmother's actually at one point, so it had been in the family for generations. Sadly, they, they lost the house. This, the flooding it was too much, and he, he just he broke down in tears on the air in your heart, just for whatever, obviously to him and his family, and, and so many others. I mean, it's just that it just goes to show you when Mother Nature gets involved, or just how humbling it truly can be. Really, for sure. <laughs> because you can see it's murky, it's all full of soil. Soil is being washed off at an extraordinary rate. I mean, you're not going to be able to stop it by sticking a sieve out there or something and trying to catch it. It's just a geologic phenomena at this point, moving up tens of thousands of cubic meters of soil down rivers that are swollen out of all proportion up in Canada. Take a look.
Now the flooding is what we're focusing on, but I'm asking you to take a look too at the, the impact, and let's jump ahead here, to what's happening to the soil system. It's just staggering. Now you can get a sense of it from a, a shot like this. This is just flood water completely suspending the sediments and soil in here and then transporting it further downstream. Uh, we're so used to looking at the tragedies of human life, that, which is appropriate, uh, but we're not looking at the, the gash and the destruction to the whole bio-ecosystem beneath it. And we need to start paying attention to that because in effect, it's in these China flood cases, it's building up from year to year. But more on the standard forecast, I'm joined by Jennifer Turner. She's director of the China Environment Forum at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, glad to be here. So extreme weather, uh, extreme events, do you think that rainy seasons have actually gotten worse in China, or is this just part of another cycle? Well, it, it does appear that the rain, it has gotten worse. I mean, everyone that you talk to, I mean, there's the anecdotes, of course, but scientists are saying, yes, it's, it's getting much worse over the years. I mean, you mentioned last year, it was in July, North, South China, a lot of storms. Um, in fact, in Wuhan, you know, they said it wasn't just because of the rain, it was also because the cities hadn't been investing in stormwater runoff, and a lot of the, the lakes and wetlands had been filled in, and so it made the city very vulnerable to any kind of rain. And so, while the weather may be getting worse, cities aren't really doing enough to protect themselves from that rain. So we're seeing some warnings, some forecasting already. What else do you think needs to be done ahead of this projected catastrophic flooding? Well, just this year in Zhejiang province, I think it was Pingyang County, there was a, there was a typhoon, 30,000 people affected. And when I read the stories, it was really fascinating because how the public dealt with this, they said, well, on the first floor, we don't live there. We don't keep anything important there. We, we kind of move up to the second floor when when the, when the rain's coming, that's not really a good strategy for the long run. No, it's not a good strategy for the long run for a lot of reasons. It's focusing on immediate impact and survival of that event. That's true. That's crucial. But it's not sufficient. We have to look at the longer term. If you look at the amount of mud and silt coming into those cities, they look at it as a, uh, an urban problem. Right? Well, in fact, it's a rural problem having to do with topsoils. At the same time, large areas of the world are subject to drought. The road in Somalia is getting worse. 2.9 million people already struggling to survive. And the region around Baidoa is one of the hardest hit. Both the recurrent droughts and the recurrent conflicts have uh, severely depleted the resources of the farmers. They've depleted the resources of the farmer and ruined topsoil. Topsoil that's dried out can easily be blown away in dust stands, uh, dust storms, and leave whole areas increasingly vulnerable to food shortage and becoming refugees. Take a look. Voice of America. Voice of America has reported on it. Children in India dig through garbage at a community dump in search of food. A severely malnourished child in Ethiopia struggles to survive. These disturbing scenes illustrate the growing problem of hunger around the world. A new UN report says for the first time in history, more than one billion people are undernourished worldwide. Okay, now this is not just in Africa, it's elsewhere as well, but the most dramatic climate-driven refugee problems and famine are occurring in Africa again and again. 
but the UN is warning that it's a global hunger crisis and in fact it's partially because the Western countries and the developed countries have not been developing a response and fast enough. The US and other wealthy nations slash aid and the UN is trying to make an appeal. We turn now to what the United Nations World Food Program has called a silent tsunami of hunger. It's been described as the worst food crisis since the 1970s. According to the Food and Agricultural Organization, more than a billion people, or one-sixth of the world's population, go hungry every day. Last year alone, 37 countries experienced riot riots over skyrocketing food prices. But the world's richest nations have slashed their funding for food aid to their lowest levels in two decades. The World Food Program warned this week that more than 40 million people will have their food rations reduced or eliminated because of the drastic aid cuts. Okay, now those aid cuts were going on then, back uh, several years ago, and they've even become more pronounced with the new administration in the United States. This is worrisome because of the kind of long-term trend that people like Sir David Attenborough have been warning about for years. There have been prophets who warned us of this impending disaster, of course. One of the first was Thomas Malthus. His most important book, An Essay of the Principle of Population, was published over 200 years ago in 1798. In it, he argued that the human population would increase inexorably until it was halted by what he called misery and vice. Today, for some reason, that prophecy seems to be largely ignored or at any rate disregarded. It's true that he did not foresee the so-called Green Revolution, which greatly increased the amount of food that can be produced in any given area of arable land. And there may be other advances in our food producing skills that we ourselves still can't foresee. But such advances only delay things. The fundamental truth that Malthus proclaimed remains the truth. There cannot be more people on this earth that can be fed. There cannot be more people on this earth than can be fed. Why haven't we heard the warnings? Well, he says so very clearly. There have been prophets who warned us of this impending disaster, of course. One of the first was Thomas Malthus. But the object of Thomas Malthus was ignored in part because we thought we had solved the food problem. And in fact, we haven't. That's it. They're either mad or an economist. And the reason why that's so dangerous is because economists keep on talking about the economics of growth, 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 not looking at what it depends upon, especially the agroecological basis of growth. If you're destroying the topsoil, increasing weather events that are both floods and droughts, moving people into camps that need dependent food supplies because of the famines, you can't keep up with it. And that's becoming more and more apparent now as we look at famine in Africa. The world's largest humanitarian crisis in 70 years has been declared in three African countries nearly 16 million people at risk of dying from famine in South Sudan, Somalia, and Nigeria. Uh. Okay, it's not just in the Horn of Africa, it's now in the heart of Nigeria, and it's here, in fact, where most of the relevance to the radical Islamic groups get their support. How is the world responding to the emerging food crisis provoked by the climate changes we're experiencing? Well, one is, 
one move has been to grab land from those who are less able to protect it and convert it into industrial agricultural production. Take a look, this is happening in Africa now. Dividing up the world's bread basket, rich countries are racing to buy and lease agricultural land abroad and secure their food supplies for the future. Critics are calling it a colonial land grab. The scale is something we've never seen before. I mean, there are huge pieces of land, six million acres in the Congo, bought by China to grow palm oil. It's reported 40 million hectares of land has been bought or leased in $100 billion worth of deals. Now the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization is proposing a code of conduct to guide the global land grab. Governments need to be much more uh, assertive that the moment they're signing away huge pieces of uh, their territory for very little money and very few guarantees. And industrialized agriculture. The peasants who are being displaced on this land and replaced by foremen who are hired from India, capitalists available from Dubai or from China, and in effect they're pursuing a carbon intensive form of agriculture rather than a carbon restorative form. So in effect they're adding to the amount of carbon that we're putting in the atmosphere rather than restoring carbon to the topsoils. This is why people like Bill Muma over at Tufts have emphasized that we need to develop a whole new strategy called restorative development to come out of this crisis. We have to look at the way we can fix carbon in the topsoil. Groups like Soil for Climate, Restoring Soil to Reverse Global Warming have been getting going and so is a group called Biodiversity for a Livable Planet or Climate. They're both based here in Massachusetts and you should join them, get in touch with them. See what the problem is ecologically. The more a biodiverse an ecosystem is, the better it is able to respond to catastrophic, yeah. to human impacts, to, to pollution impacts. The soil, as it builds up the humus, carbon is being sequestered into the soil, and then as the soil debris and the wood debris build up in the ecosystem, the carbon bank is being built as well. So you're not liberating this into the atmosphere. While nature is doing all these things for us for free, our systems should also work alongside nature, further accelerating ecological benefits. Agriculture off fossil fuels can put ancient sunlight back in the ground while also feeding the world with current sunlight. Regenerative organic agriculture can not only reduce climate change but reverse climate change. And here's how it works. Photosynthesis relies on the ability of the plant to pull carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then using the energy from the sun and water and nutrients from the soil create carbohydrates. If we could generalize across the globe regenerative organic practices, we could actually sequester more than 100% of the current annual CO2 emissions in deserts, in jungles, in temperate zones. We can put carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and put it back into the ground whence it came. Right. That's where it's coming from. And if you abuse the soils or lose them in floods and droughts, you're losing real capital. This is why the symphony of the soil has made the case very powerfully. Most of the planet is not living. It's mineral, it's never known life, it's just this rock. And yet soil starts forming on it and creates this very thin layer where life is possible. Soil is the interface between biology and geology. It's sort of the living skin of the earth. Oh, 
about 200 to 300 yards of our own compost every year. Well, we don't grow plants, we grow soil, and soil grows plants. Now that's the crucial insight. We don't grow plants. We grow soil, if we know what we're doing. And soil grows plants. We can't photosynthesize. You can stand in the sun all day you want to, and in effect you'll get a sunburn. You can't capture solar energy. Plants do that, but plants can't grow without soil. There are people like John Yu who have shown us how this can be done on a large scale. He's done it in China and Ethiopia as well, and he's changing the metaphor. That is, the paradigm. What if we change, he suggested. Basically, humans are a keystone species that can steward and regenerate our planet if we realize the basic insight. We make about 200 to 300 yards of our own compost every year. Well, we don't grow plants, we grow soil, and soil grows plants. This fall just goes down and down and down and down and down. Deep, rich, and I didn't stall off like that. Well, we don't grow plants, we grow soil, and soil grows plants. Right, but it didn't start off like that, it had to be built by the keystone species. We don't grow plants, we grow soil, and soil grows plants. Michael Pollan has put it very powerfully. Soil is a living miracle. In one handful of soil, there are more organisms than there are humans on Earth. And we are only beginning to understand this vast network of beings right beneath our feet. We rely on healthy soil for 95% of what we eat. Yet, we take it for granted. Thousands of years of plowing, deforestation, and erosion have left our soils in dire shape. And we're accelerating the loss of this essential resource. But there's a lot more to the story. When soil is damaged, it releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this has had serious consequences for the climate. Too much carbon in the atmosphere is causing the Earth to overheat. That excess carbon is also acidifying our oceans, threatening marine life. Meanwhile, there's not enough carbon where it once was, in the soil. In fact, many of the world's cultivated soils have lost more than 50% of their original carbon stocks. Now, that's the kind of tragedy he points to, and if we don't turn it around, as a keystone species, we're going to be in bad shape. We urgently need a new kind of citizen science alliance to work on the science of the soil and make sure we can restore it, not destroy it.